please welcome Ingrid Newman for tonight's presentation. Good evening and thank you for attending tonight and mostly thank you for your interest in the Grey Canal. So I've hiked the Grey Canal many times and I've often wondered about the history of this former historical irrigation system. Who? Who were the visionaries who thought of this and created it? What? What was the Grey Canal? Where? Where did the water come from and where did the canal go? When? Was it built? How was it constructed? And how did it transform this area? So this evening, I'm going to answer all those questions and even more. Coldstream Ranch. The Great Canal had its beginning at the Coldstream Ranch. This land that we're sitting on right now, Kalamalka Lake Provincial Park, was once part of the Coldstream Ranch. Let's go back 159 years ago to the year 1863. The residents of this semi-arid desert were the nomadic Okanagan First Nations people. The Silks people lived here for thousands of years. Then in September 1863, three young Irishmen arrived by horse at the north end of Okanagan Lake near where the Spalamchine Golf Course is today. They were in search of land, gold, and adventure. These young men in their early 20s were from noble and titled upper class. They grew up in castles in Ireland and had formal education. But since they were not the first born in their family, there was little possibility for them inheriting family lands, titles, or holding public office. All three had served in the British Army and were entitled to a military land grant in the new colony of British Columbia. The eldest, Charles Houghton, 24 years old, had served as captain. Brothers, Charles, 23 years old, and Forbes, 20 year old, had both held the rank of lieutenant. Despite only serving a short time as captain, Houghton could preempt 1,450 acres, while the lieutenant, lieutenants, Charles and Forbes Vernon, were entitled to 160 acres each. So I have a 25-year-old son, and I just try to imagine him coming here at that time on such an adventure way back then. So upon arriving here, uh, in this area, Houghton. He was eager for his land because he got the biggest piece, so he wanted to find some land. While the Vernon brothers, they were lured by gold and silver. So in 1863, gold and silver had been recently discovered by Cherryville and Cherry Creek, and there were 1,200 prospectors there. They had arrived from all over the world looking for gold. So the Vernon brothers left Houghton at Okanagan Lake and they headed off to Cherryville, where they spent two seasons mining for the elusive precious metals. So this is a photo of Captain Charles Frederick Houghton. I'm going to pass them around. They're courtesy of the Vernon Museum, and they're just helping you visualize the past better. So if you just pass them around. And also, they're probably going to keep you awake as you're passing them on to the neighbor, so <laughs> won't fall asleep. Well, Houghton was searching for his parcel of land. Captain Charles Houghton was enamored with this Coldstream stream valley. So just imagine him traveling from the Okanagan Lake. He climbs up over the commonage and he's standing on the Kalamalka lookout, looking over Kalamalka Lake, down the Coldstream stream valley, towards Lumbee, Lavington, and the Monashee Mountains in the distance. In a letter dated June 3rd, 1864, he describes the northwest side of the Coldstream Valley as being covered to the top with fine bunch grass and not very heavily timbered, while that forming the southeast boundary is densely covered from base to summit with pine timber. A good sized stream of pure water flows right down the middle of the valley and empties into the head of the lake. 
So Houghton staked his 1,450 acres in this valley and named the Cool Creek running through his lands as Coal Stream. Yeah, that's where it got its name. So eight years later, in 1871, Captain Houghton was elected to the House of Commons in Ottawa. Too busy with politics, Houghton exchanged these lands to the Vernon Brothers in 1872, and they continued to expand and expand and expand the Coldstream Ranch. And three years later, the younger brother Forbes Vernon also entered politics and was ele elected to the BC Legislature in 1875. And then a year later, he became Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works. An article from the Okanagan Historical Society states, During his long official career, Honorable F.G. Vernon proved to be one of the most capable and public-spirited men ever chosen for office for the people of British Columbia, and the affairs of his department prospered greatly through his terms. And the city of Vernon is named after the Honorable Forbes Vernon. So in 1883, the older brother Charles Vernon sold his share of the Coldstream Ranch to Forbes. And by 1891, Forbes Vernon was spending much of his time in Victoria, and the Coldstream Ranch was sold to Lord and Lady Aberdeen from Scotland. The Aberdeens. So here they are with their family and dog. <laughs> dogs. Lord John Hamilton Gordon, who held the title 7th Earl of Aberdeen, and his wife, Lady Ishbel Maria Marjorie Banks, were important settlers who had a significant impact on how the Coldstream Valley and the Greater Vernon area developed. At the time of the purchase, the Coldstream Ranch had increased in size from the 1,470 acres to 13,261 acres and included 2,000 cattle, 62 horses, 70 hogs, 70 sheep, and 50 head of poultry. But the Aberdeens had a different view that, or vision than cattle ranching for this massive property. They commissioned the planting of 25,000 apple, pear and cherry trees on 100 acres of their property. And in so doing, they became pioneers of the commercial fruit growing industry in the Okanagan Valley. They also cultivated hops, tobacco, and a variety of vegetables. They established a jam factory in Vernon to process their harvested strawberries, raspberries, gooseberries, and currants. An article printed in Maclean's magazine in 1906 boldly states, Canadian apples and plums are unsurpassable in the world, and those grown by Lord Aberdeen in the Okanagan Valley are unsurpassable in Canada. To water their vast orchards, an irrigation system known as the Coal Stream Internal System was developed, which was the beginning of the Grey Canal. And taking water mainly from Coldstream Creek, water moved through a series of human-built ditches towards Kalamalka Lake. And in 1892, a year later, the Aberdeens began subdividing these ranch lands into smaller 10 to 40 acre orchard estates, complete with fruit trees and irrigation. British and Canadian upper-class aristocracy were invited to purchase these fruit farms and immigrate to the Okanagan Valley. A selling feature was irrigated lands at a guaranteed set water rate, a rare proposition at the time. And to assist the new lands owners, Coldstream Ranch sold fruit trees from their nursery. If these trees were destroyed or did not thrive, the ranch guaranteed to replace a percentage of them. A year later in 1893, Lord Aberdeen was appointed the seventh Governor General of Canada which he served for five years. And during his duty as Governor General, Lord and La Lady Aberdeen traveled extensively across Canada and Britain, promoting the Okanagan Valley as a desirable place to live with fruit farming as a choice way of life. 
W.C. Ricardo. Here he is with his family on Coldstream Ranch. In 1895, William Crawley Ricardo was hired as the Coldstream Ranch manager. According to Lord Aberdeen, Ricardo was the right man for the place. He proved to be a remarkable visionary, changing Coldstream and Vernon's outcome. Born in England, Ricardo had extensive farming and ranching experience. He expanded and improved the Coldstream internal irrigation system, which increased the ranch agricultural production tremendously. And it was Ricardo who was the driving force to recreate a larger irrigation system that would provide water to more land around Vernon. Heavily involved in the community, Ricardo became the first Reeve, or the mayor of Coldstream, in 1907. So as more and more settlers started arriving in the valley, Ricardo and the Aberdeens began plans for a longer, more complex irrigation system. Albert Edward Ashcroft. Albert Ashcroft, a civil engineer and land surveyor, was hired to implement Ricardo's vision, which would become the Grey Canal. In a 1905 letter to Ricardo, Ashcroft wrote, The scheme which you have conceived and so long and carefully investigated will prove to be one of the soundest and best irrigation projects on the continent and easily the best in this province. Ashcroft chose the Okanagan Highland as the water source. So that would be up behind us, up behind Lavington, south of Lavington, and it goes all the way to Kelowna. It was situated at a much higher elevation and it offered numerous mountain lakes which were replenished mainly from melted snow. And the lakes, when dammed, served as a water storage facility and they could be run off gradually throughout the growing season, thereby providing a steady source of water. So lakes Aberdeen and Haddo were dammed as per Albert Ashcroft's plan and then the released waters entered Duto Creek. Here's a picture of Aberdeen Dam and the spillway. That's where the water, extra water, runs off, the excess water. From that dam, water flowed 15 kilometers north, downhill through the rugged canyons to the head gates near Lavington. And then from Lavington, Duto Creek normally flows northeast and enters the Shuswap Lake and into the Fraser River watershed. But Ashcroft's plan diverted the water in the opposite direction, heading northwest into Okanagan Lake and into the Columbia River watershed. So this map shows the Grey Canal route. You'll see it better when it's in front of you, but Aberdeen Lake, it follows Duto Creek to the head gates, which are near Lavington. And then a smaller diversion augmented the Coldstream internal system. The main canal, the Blue Line, continued on a circuitous 50 kilometer route up the north side of the Coldstream Valley, around Coldstream, Vernon, BX, Swan Lake, Bella Vista, and terminated near Kin Beach on Okanagan Lake. In recognition of Albert Ashcroft's remarkable work, an eight foot monument stands at the Kalamalka Lake Lookout on Highway 97 big blue metal thing. The monument states, to commemorate the work of our pioneer engineers, among them Albert Edward Ashcroft, especially for his design of the works of the Vernon Irrigation District, 1905 to 1912, erected by the Association of Professional Engineers of British Columbia and the Engineering Institute of Canada, Central BC branches. In 1958, at the formal unveiling of the a monument, Bishop, Bishop Sovereign stated, The true monument to Mr. Ashcroft lies around us. The Vernon Irrigation Dr District has transformed parched lands into fertile and fruitful fields, the product of Mr. Ashcroft's mind and hand. Earl Grey. The tea, yeah. Not not him. 
but close. <laughs> the Grey Canal is named after Albert Henry George, the fourth Earl Grey, and Canada's ninth Governor General. So I think it was one of his uncles that made the tea. Earl Grey owned the Learmouth Ranch near the canal head gates by Lavington. His lands would greatly benefit from the irrigation system. Earl and Lady Grey officiated at the opening of the head gates on October 6, 1906. As Governor General, Earl Grey encouraged farming in the Okanagan and praised the fruit farmer as the most desirable of all citizens. <laughs> Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier at the time commented that Lord Grey gave his whole heart, his whole soul, and whole life to Canada. You may recognize Earl Grey's name on the Canadian football trophy, which he donated in 1909, the Grey Cup. But it's interesting to note that two ambitious Canadian governor generals own substantial agricultural lands in the Coldstream Valley and were both instrumental in promoting settlers and fruit farming and fruit growing to the North Okanagan. So, construction. When was the Grey Canal constructed? Construction began in 1906 and it took eight years to build. By 1909, the canal had reached BX Creek. By 1910, it had crossed the north end of Swan Lake to Goose Lake. And the final section to Okanagan Lake was completed in 1914. Any ideas how much the canal cost to construct in those days? 450? Close. 423,000. <laughs> I don't have any door prizes, <laughs> tax, <laughs> and inflation. How was the Great Canal constructed? It was built using very basic equipment compared to today. So steam shovels, two steam shovels, uh, construction workers operated, moving the earth and digging out ditches, and to level the, the ground, a team of horses pulled a slip scraper to flatten the uneven earth and smooth it out. And then they only had simple hand tools and human strength used to construct the many wooden structures along the canal. At one time, over 60 men and 25 horse teams worked day and night shifts to complete this gigantic job. So how was the water transported? The irrigation water flowed mainly in dugout canals or ditches. These ditches were sometimes six meters wide, 20 feet, and a depth of one meter, about three feet deep. Water was flowing through it. And then when the terrain was rough or uneven, flumes were built to direct and contain the water flow. So here's a wooden flume. Also up to three meters wide, flumes were constructed of wood and steel sheets. They were suspended high above on the uneven ground on wooden trestles. 18 flumes were built along the Great Canal. The longest flume was on the east side of Swan Lake, above where the water slides are today. And this challenging terrain required a 750 meter long flume, that's half a mile, to tr transport water along the steep rocky hillside. And you can still see pieces of that suspended bloom along that section of the Grey Canal Trail. And the highest flume, flume number 16, as it was called, towered 12 meters, 40 feet above the ground. And that was located in the Bella Vista area on the Davidson Orchard property. So how was the irrigation water transported 50 kilometers without pumps in those days? Gravity was the only force used to move a staggering amount of water over a great distance. Most of the Great Canal was built on hillsides where gravity allowed the water to flow downwards naturally onto the fields below. But to move the water forward for 50 kilometers, the canal route had to be at a precise downhill slope that pushed the water forward. The slope had to be the, at the exact grade that it didn't flow too slowly or too quickly. So a skillful crew carefully plotted and measured the route, 
prior to construction. But the Great Canal did not always move downhill, where the irrigation water reached valleys and ravines and steep rock cliffs, a different method to raise the water was required. In the days before pumps, an inverted siphon was used to move the water uphill. So water going into the siphon, the inlet, was at a higher elevation than where the water came out, the outlet. And this long siphon was handmade from wooden planks wrapped with wire, similar to a wine cask, a wooden wine cask. So here are the construction workers tying up or winding up a wooden siphon in the BX Creek. So when water entered that wooden pipe, pressure within the siphon due to gravity was enough to push the water up the opposite hillside. The Lavington siphon measured 71 centimeters in diameter, about two feet, and was two kilometers long. It crossed the Coldstream Valley and then rose up the north side of the valley. The BX Creek siphon was 290 meters long and it was especially cha challenging as it dropped steeply down into the deep narrow ravine and then climbed up the other side. And the longest siphon was three kilometers at the north end of Swan Lake. It crossed the valley by the water slides and then went across the north end of Swan Lake and up the hillside to Goose Lake. Later, the wooden siphons were replaced with sturdy steel pipe. And on the Turtle Mountain section of the Great Canal Trail, you can see remnants of the night siphon along the steep cliffside. It's a thick steel pipe measuring 720 meters long. And at one point, the irrigation water passed through a rock tunnel. A 67 meter tunnel was built through a steep rock outcrop on Turtle Mountain, above where the current SBCA buildings are today. So this map shows the location of all the siphons and the tunnels along the route. There were two reservoirs which were part of the Great Canal. The first one was at Black Rock, an outcrop on the east side of the city of Vernon. And then from here, five irrigation lines carried the water further north, south, and west. And the second reservoir was at Goose Lake. It's about three quarters along the route of the Great Canal, trail, uh, Great Canal irrigation system from the intake. And it irrigated the land on the west side of Swan Lake and then all the way around to Bella Vista. Goose Lake was used as a balancing reservoir, allowing for pressure changes and for the storage of additional water when the water levels were low, which apparently happened quite a bit. So how did the Gray Canal affect this Greater Vernon area? As the Gray Canal irrigation waters arrived along the benchlands around Greater Vernon, the landscape, settlement, economy, and farming were transformed. The land below the canal changed from dry hillsides to productive farmland. Settlers from around the world, around the globe, arrived. And agriculture was changed from ranching and dry land farming to growing vegetables and fruits. So how did the water get from the canal onto the farmer's fields? So along the Great Canal, if you hike it today, you'll discover the remains of concrete water boxes. This one is above Davidson Orchard. These boxes or weirs were used to redirect and measure the water from the canal before it went onto the farmer's fields. And the method of irrigating the water below the canal was called furrow irrigation. To prevent the irrigation water from flooding straight into their fields, farmers plowed ditches across the top of the fields. And then from there, they dug carefully placed furrows to guide the waters to the crops. The furrows are coming down from the canal. So the farmers had to be very precise in creating these fur furrows, how wide they were, how long they would be, how deep they were, where they were located, making sure that each plant received enough water. But this gravity-based method of irrigation caused extensive topsoil erosion over time. Ditchwalker, an important person who took care of the irrigation canal and water was a ditchwalker. 
ditch walkers were responsible for measuring water in those concrete boxes. Farmers ordered their water from the ditch walker well ahead for their daily or weekly usage. And walking along the canal every day, ditch walkers made sure that the canal was not blocked or leaking or that no one was stealing any water. And they performed important repairs and even raised and lowered the gates at Aberdeen Lake. They became an important form of social contact, sharing community news among rural farmers, kind of like Facebook today. <laughs> and later, Ditch Walker wasn't that appealing, so they were called water bailiffs, and they now drove a vehicle along the canal rather than walking. In 1923, there were 23 bailiffs employed by the Vernon Irrigation District. So the excellent soil and growing conditions along the Bella Vista lands attracted many Japanese immigrants to settle and farm here. Vegetables were originally grown along those hillsides on Bella Vista, but they were eventually replaced with fruit orchards. And the first Japanese community hall was built in 1935 and was instrumental in preserving the Japanese culture and community. So who managed the Great Canal? Several organizations built, paid for, and managed the Great Canal during its 65 years of existence. The White Valley Irrigation and Power Company. In 1906, to help finance, construct, and operate the Great Canal, the White Valley Irrigation and Power Company was created. It was founded by the Aberdeens and Ricardo and several other important shareholders and it was incorporated as a subsidiary of the Coldstream Ranch. The Land and Agricultural Company. Eager to invest in the area, wealthy Belgian capitalists formed the Land and Agricultural Company, also called LNA. By 1907, they owned 16,000 acres of agricultural lands around Vernon. So this map just shows in orange the LNA lands around Swan Lake, Bella Vista, all the way to Coldstream, wrapped around Swan Lake, to Canadian Lakeview Estates, and it even went up to Spalamsheen. And it just shows in comparison to the Coldstream Ranch size. So in 1907, the White Valley Irrigation and Power Company extended the irrigation system to serve part of the LNA lands. The LNA company contributed $150,000 towards the irrigation system. Here's a fun fact. In 1911, the LNA company constructed the concrete building in downtown Vernon that currently houses the Bean Scene Coffee House. That's the old LNA company headquarters. Then there was the Vernon Irrigation District, the VID. In 1920, the VID was formed to manage and maintain the Great Canal. To reduce water losses, because there was a lot of seepage happening, Wooden flumes were rebuilt with steel lining, and wooden siphons were replaced with steel pipes, and concrete slabs were added to the sides of the earth ditches. In 1965, the gravity-fed system was replaced with pressurized underground pipes, allowing for year-round delivery. In 1971, the Grey Canal was abandoned, and replaced with a more efficient irrigation methods such as sprinklers and drip irrigation. At one time, the Grey Canal supplied water to the largest irrigation district in British Columbia. They provided water to over 20,000 acres. That was more water than the system that supplied water to the city of Vancouver in 1938. So to commemorate the importance of the Grey Canal, there's a marble plaque in the Spirit Square. That's the park between City Hall and the museum. And there's a walkway in between there around the plaque and it has words written in the paving stones such as water, ditch walkers, fruit, 1906. Then comes the Ribbons of Green Trail Society. Since 2005, the Ribbons of Green Trail Society, a trail advocacy group, has been working to create a public continuous hiking system along or near the Grey Canal. This 50 kilometer trail would start in Coldstream and follow the benchlands around Swan Lake to Okanagan Lake. 
what a wonderful transportation corridor, allowing users to appreciate the significant contributions made by our predecessors. Seven portions of the trail have been built and are currently popular hiking set trails. Each trail has a unique vantage point with incredible vistas. Most of the trails are pretty flat and they're rated easy. And you'll find several remnants of the Gray Canal irrigation system along them. Big news flash. This summer, five new interpretive signs will be installed along the Gray Canal. And they're in, gonna include some of these archival photos and much of the history that we talked about tonight. So on our Ribbons of Green website, you can find information about the 57 local trails, including the Gray Canal trails. And from our website, you can click on our online interactive trail map, and we've organized the trails into easy, intermediate, and difficult. And then also included for each of those trails is a photo, how long the trail is, describes what you'll see, features, access and parking locations, wheelchair access, and safety warnings. So I have here some business cards that have the Ribbons of Green website, so help yourself. And also we have some Vernon Tourism trail maps. Please help yourself too. They contain information about the Grey Canal and other popular local trails. <laughs> He's telling me to quit. Okay, so in closing, I, I got the message. <laughs> I encourage you to get out and take a walk along the Grey Canal with new understanding and appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.